hello, beautiful human. You clicked on our interview with Tiesto, and this man is beyond a legend. He shaped multiple genres of music. He has a new record out now. It's called Jackie Chan, and I felt really lucky to have him sitting right there in my studio. This is one of the coolest conversations I've ever had, and I think you're going to enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it. Please leave your honest feedback in the comment section below. We do have a podcast. Link in the description below, and it'd be really cool if you subscribed. Please? Okay. Enjoy. Let's do this. Hey, we got Heather. Hi. We got Dan. Hey. And uh, sitting in the studio right now, it's Tiesta. Come on. <laughs> Hello. Yo, what's up? What's up? <laughs> Yo. Yo. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> it really means a lot, man. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. I, obviously, I've soaked in your art as a fan for a very long time. But yesterday, I, I had a really awesome process just digging into the, the hole that is Tiesto. Ah. And beyond the fact that you have shaped an entire genre, you you are you continue to be relevant, but you're you're you you say that you live in the present, right? Yeah. And the best part about being a DJ, one of the beauties, is this idea that you can change all the time. Yeah. How do you change but keep yourself? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I just uh, I just play what I like actually. So it's it's always what I like first, and then the, the crowd likes it too. So that's a great bonus. So <laughs> for me, it all works out. So um, yeah, that's that's the, that's the most important thing. That's also what I tell uh, new producers. As the biggest advice is just make what you really feel and play what you really feel because then the crowd will understand it anyway, and they they will they will be able to follow you. But how you feel, it's different every day, or does your inspiration change daily? Yeah, well, not not daily, but it, it changes over a period of time. I, I get to in a certain mood, and then I stay there for a while, and then I move on to the next one. And that's how I do do it with my music as well. So the, if you hear me like three times in two weeks, it's, it will be a very similar set. Not the exact same, but a, a similar mood, and then... Two weeks later, it could be something different. What inspires that? What inspires that change? Um, just my my whole life, like meeting people, uh, see how the crowd reacts on music, or traveling, um, you know, sitting on a beach in Cabo. <laughs> <laughs> Anything could change it. Yeah. But you don't stop, really. No, because why? Why would I? You know, I have an amazing life. I love what I do. There's nothing better than playing music for other people mm -hmm. and and make them happy and. Uh, and be in the studio as well and make that stuff. It's just amazing. So why not? <laughs> Jackie Chan is a single right now. And uh, you feeling good about it? I feel great about it. You know, it's, it's, been, it's been a while since I had like a, a, a pop-ish kind of hit. You, you, always, so. you always say that like you're not like Beyonce. You're not like the other legends. You don't have a, a trillion number ones. Yeah. But you you have a few. <laughs> I'm getting there now. <laughs> no, th this is the, the first one in a while. And, and I'm very excited about it because it's still close to what I am. You know, it's, it's, it's dance music. It's, I went, I didn't go out of my way and make something completely rap or, you know, or hip hop. So it's, it's very close to what I do. And I feel like the, the radio crowd loves it. And also the, the hardcore Tiesto fans who've been following me for a long time love it as well. So that's the great combo. Is that like a real win for you when you can appease both sides of that spectrum? Yeah. If I can get everybody on board and and be right in the middle, that's for me the, the dream. That's exactly where I want to be. Is there, is there a scientific process or what is the process like being able to strike so perfectly down the middle? Well, it's it's not easy. I mean, it's been very hard for me. I've been trying it for a while, but because I, I always want to make dance music, no matter what. I just want to stick to my roots as a dance DJ. So mm -hmm. it, it always has to be dance, but it's, it's a lot harder to make a good dance song because... A lot of songs are just pop, and 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 the the singer songwriters like to write on like more like a break broken beat, you know, not like really like on dance beats. So I get it's, it. It's, yeah, it's hard. Well, you look at Boom, right? That's the song with Gucci Mane. Yeah, dude, fire track. Yeah, it's, thanks. Well, when you sit down to create these beats, what is your process like? How do you enter that zone? Like, can you just walk me through like your process? Well, just to make a yeah a one bar loop and just. Keep repeating it, <laughs> and if you're not bored of it after half an hour, it's, it's something good. There you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but yeah, and then you add some more stuff and more stuff, and then you get like a whole line like this, and then you start deleting stuff and spreading it out, and that's most of the time how we work. But do you need to be in a certain headspace? Like, uh, like when do you sit in front of your computer to create actual beats? How often? Like, is it every week? Is it every day? Yeah, pretty much every day. Yeah, not not every day, but like yeah, 
every other day at least and then for, for a couple of hours or just an hour and yeah just work on different things does inspiration for these beats come consistently throughout the day where you're documenting it as you go or is it something is it something that's special that happens when you sit down in front of your computer and just go uh, yeah, b- both ways. Like uh, it could happen in both ways. Like, uh, but sometimes you know, other DJs send me a beat, and I, I get inspired on that and and move on from there. That's why I do a lot of collaborations. You know, because y- you can only do so much yourself, but to work with other people if other different different ideas on how to make music it really helps to grow yourself as well. D- you learn. What did you learn about your yourself from making Jackie Chan? Um, what I learned is that uh, that. You can make a completely different vibe on on any song, so because the song can sound completely different when you change three or four elements. Got yeah. it. How did you post Malone, Preem? I can't. What's the other guy's name? I can never pronounce. Zeko. It. Zeko. How Zeko. did you guys all come together to make this song? Yeah, it's it's been like a group effort for a while, you know, because um, Zeko and I are, are really good friends. He's from Toronto, mm-hmm. and Preem is uh, the best friend of Drake, and that's how we met, that's how we got introduced to Preem. Uh, backstage in uh, Vegas okay. and he's also friends with Zeko and, and uh, Post we knew already for a couple of years also we're, we're all friends so we just keep in touch and talking and then suddenly this Jackie Chan song showed up <laughs> with just a just a very small beat and everything and then uh, Zeko and I heard it we were like let's try to make a dance version out of this and that's that's how the song came together so it's like all loose elements in the end gotcha that's uh, yeah came together so. uh, how'd you discover Post Malone? I, I just heard his voice the first time and right away I was like, wow, this guy is special. Like, uh, yeah. Who, who, did somebody send you his stuff? Did you just come across it online? What was it? Uh, no, actually Zeko was, was the guy who, uh, who introduced me to him. He was like, you got to check out this guy, Post Malone, he's blowing up. And, uh, and that was like four years ago. Like, he was like uh, doing very small shows in LA and, and Zeko became a good friend for him there. And that's how I got introduced to him. Dude, did Jackie Chan even know this song existed? Does, has uh, anybody told him? Well, <laughs> well, we asked him like if he likes it. Okay. So he, okay. he didn't want to get involved with the song, but yeah, he 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 knows about it. Did you try to get him to like record a verse or some ad libs or something? No, you didn't no. try that. No, it's it's more like you know. I think Jackie Chan is such a legend that everybody knows him. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, so kicking it like Jackie Chan is more like, yeah, it's like it's a. It's a uh, Matter of saying, I, I, play on words. Yeah, yeah play yeah, on yeah, words. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. My English sometimes is not that great. <laughs> my first and only language. Can't talk and, either. Yeah, <laughs> I can't do it now. <laughs> I want to go back to your creative process. Do, do you work in hotel rooms? Do you have like a set location where this is your art studio, your canvas? Like, uh, no, no, I don't really work in hotel rooms. No, it's always like a, st- a little studio here or there. I work a lot at uh, Sunset Marquee. Cool. Yeah. I have like a, this old school rock and roll studio down there. <laughs> I, I live right down the street and that studio is sick. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And y- you get inspired by the energy that's filled that studio. Yeah, yeah. And then, But sometimes we just go out for a night and then get back to two in the afternoon or two in the morning and then go in the studio and just jam around. Do it. Yeah. How many beats sit on a hard drive of yours? Um, quite a lot, but I throw, I throw a lot of stuff away as well. How do you... It, it, what makes a beat that deserves to stay on your hard drive and what does a beat that gets tossed away consist of? If I just get annoyed with it. Yeah. <laughs> if Fair I enough. get annoyed with the beat and I just throw it, throw it away. And when I start, like it, but then sometimes I hate it, then I just keep it. So when in doubt, I keep it. What fuels your annoyance? Is it, I need to add more to this beat to make it something better and I can't figure it out? Or is it just like repetitive and just kind of like... Yeah, it's more like... Re- you hear it repetitively or, or repeat, repeat, repeat it. Repetitively? <laughs> yeah, repetitively. Yeah, thank Worst you very much. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and then, then after a while, you just get sick of it and then it has to go. Yeah. You're, you've are you been making, I mean, we're over like two decades now that you've yeah. been in the scene. You started when you were 14 DJing parties, school parties. Do yeah. you remember what your set was like back then? Well, it's pretty funny because when I started DJing, I played uh, really a little bit of everything. You know, it was there's all kinds of music and uh, not necessarily mashups, but it's like yeah, all all, all genres. Huh. And I feel now I'm kind of back in the, in that same space. But because uh, I feel nowadays it's it's very acceptable to play a, a rap song plus a dance song mm-hmm. and mix together, and that's that, that's how it was back in the day. So it's like full circle. Because I feel like popular music. And I, 
it's a very loose definition. It's popular, so it's whatever society deems cool. And th- pop music, really, I think, as somebody who plays pop music and has for a while, I don't. I want to be biased and say pop music shouldn't have a sound because pop music should be all inclusive. Yeah, anything can make it to the pop, you know, side of the radio, ever. Yeah, I agree. Because tastes are ever evolving, and people want whatever they want. And I don't know. I, I feel like genres too. Do you feel like genres in music are necessary? Um, I think so. Too. So, so it has more character, and you can define what kind of style it is. But you should never be a prisoner of just one style or one, one genre. You should always explore. I think that's the beauty about music. You know, can you can go any way, any way you want. And that's I think that's uh, the biggest thing. What I've achieved over the last twenty years, always keep looking for something special and different, and think a little bit more out of the box and just yeah, combine different styles. And you're always in touch. And one of the big things was you leaving trance music, right? Yeah, that was a big thing, yeah. In 2009, yeah. It was big, but but you understood that there was a shift coming, and you tapped into the next generation of people, and you understood what they wanted. Yeah. Well, I I didn't know it was going to come. I was just more, like, tired of the the genre I was in. Because I did everything possible in trance music, like uh, every remix, every song. I made, like, more than 200 songs. I was just more, like... I was out of inspiration and then you know I spent some time in LA actually I was here for like six months straight and all the DJs here were already playing like mashups and, and mixing different styles together and I was like that's that's so, that's so cool as a, as a DJ that you can just don't stick to just one genre and you can just play a little bit of everything so I was like that's that's what I want and that's why I changed my style do you, do you see that as a challenge or do you see that as freedom I see it as freedom, and that's why I called my label. I started a new label called Musical Freedom, because I, 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 it's the ultimate freedom when you can play whatever you want, and the crowd goes crazy. That's, that's <laughs> the best thing ever. Yeah. But but there is a certain skill being behind those decks and understanding. Like it's empathy, it's the ability to read energy, and it's obviously draining because you're jumping up and down. But you're also like you're locked in with them. Yeah. You, you, you like, is there a mindset or like a place that you go? before you enter Hakkasan and like freaking give these people a night that they're either going to remember or forget, but either way, it's going to be great. <laughs> either way, it's gonna, yeah, yeah. I mean, Hakkasan is different because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a really nice club. So for me, it feels more like playing in somebody's living room. <laughs> the, the party is all around me. There's people behind me on the side tables. There's a lot of stuff going yeah, on. It's huge. There's yeah. like three floors in the club. <laughs> yeah, it's three <laughs> floors. So, so that's, that's a different mindset. That, then I'm just really in, in, a, in a good vibe party mode. But when I play, let's say, the EDC, like uh, like the Daisy Carnival Festival for 100,000 people on the main stage, that's definitely a different mindset. That's definitely like, it's more like a concert almost. And you plan out your set a little bit more and you just try to keep the people on their toes and try to surprise them with a couple of new things and and also play the some other hits they do know. And it's a, it's a f- totally different game. We, we, I, I understand that. It's harder for you to read a crowd of a mass scale because, I mean, they're so spread out. There's so many of them. But Yeah, and you only have one hour. Like yeah. at Takasana, I have three hours. Well, okay. 2003 is a huge year for you in your career. It's the time you do your first stadium concert. You're yeah. the only person to ever do this. Did people think you were crazy or were people like, this is your time? You, yeah. You're going to go into this stadium and you're going to be able to sell it out. Yeah, I had no idea what we were going to sell out a, st- a stadium like that. So, um, But I played a festival in Holland the year before. Okay. And then there was like 40,000 people and they asked every every person who came in, like, who do, you, who do you want to see tonight? And like, I think 80% of people were like, we're just here for Tiesto. <laughs> and then the, the promoter of that festival, he was like, you know what, we should do a show together and just do you. Because people just want to see you. And I'm like, Okay, if you think we can pull it <laughs> off, great. <laughs> and that's how it all started. And uh, yeah, I was just mind blown. Like, yeah, the full stadium people just to see me. I was like, I was, I felt like I was dreaming. Is there pressure at all? Oh yeah, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> I felt I was like super nervous. You know, just because well, when you play on a festival, you're at with twenty other DJs, and you know, it's, people come and go, and that's what it is. But when you know that everybody's there to see just you, that's a really weird feeling. I am so sorry to interrupt the interview. I'll just be real quick. Get Quip. It's the best toothbrush out there. I'm obsessed with this thing. It sticks right to my mirror. It's timed out perfectly, so I always know that I'm brushing the right amount. They send me refill heads like every month, and that's not just for convenience. It's for my health. Plus, 
Quip is an amazing toothbrush. It's electric, and it starts at only 25 bucks. $25 for really the best toothbrush you will ever buy. I got it for Dan, Heather, my mom, my sister, my dad. Oprah uses this toothbrush, so why shouldn't you? Quip, seriously, it's the best. Go to getquip.com slash sang, and you're going to get a toothbrush starting at 25 bucks, and your free refill pack will follow. That's right. You'll get something free if you go to getquip.com slash sang. Try out the Quip toothbrush. You'll love it, but I really want you to tell me what you think. So use it and get back to me. Getquip.com slash sang. Okay, back to the interview. Tiesto Solo makes history. You perform for six hours straight. What's harder for you, a shorter set or a longer set? Um, well, that depends on the situation. Like every DJ set is different. So... I, I like long sets, but I think in the trance days it was easier to play a long set because you know songs were like ten minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. <used> to, <laughs> when I made my Delirium Silence remix, that was eleven minutes. Yeah. That song, then Adagio for Strings, the original version is like nine and a half minutes, I think. So and nowadays the song is like two and a half, three minutes. So you're like, oh, it's kind of long already. <laughs> right? so, yeah, yeah. These songs still on. What? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like it's, uh, people have changed as well. The, mm-hmm. the attention span of music and how people approach, uh, listen to music. So it's completely different now. So consumption habits of music, pro artist or is it against art? Like even even down to the fact that people consume new music every week. They want new records from people every couple months. I mean, it's a, it's a lot more work on the artist. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, that makes it fun, right? It's, uh, yeah. it's, the, the challenge is great, and I think I think we're, we're about to change everything again. Like maybe the the whole long long tracks come back, and music is gonna keep evolving and changing. So are you feeling it? Yeah, I feel like a change is coming. Yeah. What trend do you hate right now in music? Um, I've, I've, I hate the trend that everybody's trying to copy each other all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of a lot of People are successful with the one sound, and then everybody else jumps on the bandwagon and starts to make that. Do Do you think people do that because it's easy or or safe? I think it's easy, and they like okay, he's successful with that, so I I, sh- I want to be like that too. Would you consider them real artists if they're just kind of copying somebody else's sound? Yeah, well, if you copy it well, maybe, but <laughs> yeah. in, in, in general, they always say it's better to make a good copy than than steal something. Or, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, I, I think the real artists are always the guys that come up with something completely new and fresh. Do you think that's why you don't have as many radio hits as like Calvin Harris or Diplo or the Chainsmokers? Because you're just like doing whatever you want and people aren't kind of used to what you're doing? Yeah, I think so. Because I, I always think about my dance floor people so I, I don't really think about radio mm-hmm. I, I mean I love radio of course <laughs> yeah. I, I want to be on the radio <laughs> sure you do <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to be on the radio under my conditions yeah. and, and I think if you go too far then you know that's not going to work for me I mm-hmm. think, yeah so it's, for me that's why I, yeah probably the, but that's also the beauty about Calvin Harris like he's the master in, in making completely what he wants and it still hits the radio he's just yeah he is good at that isn't he he's, he's brilliant you know yeah. he's, he's the, the best one I know I think so <laughs> I, I wish I had more skills like him but uh. <laughs> when you listen to a Calvin Harris record what do you listen for and how do you break that down um, yeah everything like the the sounds he uses and, and the simplicity in it sometimes uh, you know when I heard one kiss with Dua Lipa I was like yeah it's, this song is alright and he's back to house music now yeah and it's it sounds like a, a very normal house track, but the more you listen it, it gets better and better and better. And that's always with his songs. By the way, like the untrained ear. So the majority of people who are listening to One Kiss when we play it on the radio have no idea that it's a house record. You know, they're just they're, they're listening to it because that that production, that beat, those lyrics, it makes them feel. It brings something out of them. Like it, it just it hits them. Yeah. So it's it's it, like you know. W- People, I, I do think, the mass scale, at least on the radio, they're kind of genreless for the most part. Like, I don't think, like, you know, Betsy yeah. in South Dakota knows that it's a house record. It's a house record. Yeah, yeah probably not. Yeah. No. yeah. But house music, or when the beat is there, it always gives you that positive energy, I think. Mm-hmm. That's why it's always been so popular. Yeah. But on the radio, it's, it's harder to play, I guess, because people get distracted by the beat. But he mixes it down perfectly so you can still hear it, but it's kind of in the background. So, we, it, it's so scientific. Do you think your process is scientific? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, scientific. I, I always try to make sure the kick is extra hard. So in, instead, Calvin t- takes it back. I'd bring it more to the front because I want 
people to feel the punch when it you're hits, on the yeah. dance floor. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's a reason though that his songs are more successful on the radio because those not everybody likes that hard kick and that's that's good for like clubs and concerts? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he's always been like that. He always makes make made uh, you know hit hit records for the radio. Family friendly. Yeah, but not not on purpose. But that's just, that's just his style, and yeah. he's so good at it. Do you think you need a celebrity or pop star vocalist to make a hit record? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that's that's kind of overrated. I think I think it's still a hit, but I mean, it, it's uh, if you have a re- very good record, it doesn't really matter who's on it. If it's a great vocal and a great song, it's going to be a hit. What do you, you know, think about? All at, oh, sorry. Oh, so if you look at uh, last year, Alan Walker, he had his track "Faded." It was mm-hmm. huge uh, in Europe, and the the singer is, is an, an unknown singer from Norway. So, and this, the song was number one all over Europe. So, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. No. What do you think about like all the DJ beef, whether it's Diplo and Zed or Dead Mouse and someone else? Yeah, you know, my 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 girlfriend told me to stay out of it. So. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta listen to the girlfriend. <laughs> hey, generation with Avicii, you say that the records are real. There are two that yeah. exist right now that are not finished. Have you thought about finishing them? Yeah, I, I thought about finishing them, but I thought very quickly about it that I'm not gonna finish them because you know. Tim was not happy with the records and I wasn't completely happy with him either. So I think it's just a compromise to, to finish him just for the sake of it. And I think, uh, you know, he's, he should be there when, when I finish yeah. those records. So And you might even need him, right? Like, is it, is it ever fully finished if he didn't give that seal of approval? No, it's, it never, no. never is. So I'm like, why would I release it then? Like, like just to try to uh, claim o- of his fame or something? Like, no, I just, I just want to keep him like... Yeah, his his legacy. Yeah, I mean, he, he was such an amazing producer. He, yeah. he made so many hits. Like uh, I've been playing a lot of Avicii tracks in my sets lately because you know we missed we all missed the guy and uh, people love his music still. So what did you learn from him? Um, what I learned from him is that you know uh, a lot of stuff actually. You know, I, he was always thinking outside the box. Like when he made "Wake Me Up," and he played it the first time on uh, in Miami. Like the whole crowd was was slaughtering him on uh, on social media. Like everybody hated it and country house and they made jokes about it. And then three weeks later, it's number one in the world, and everybody's like, "Oh, this is amazing!" <laughs> Changes instantly. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So he just uh, he had his own. He had no rules. He just made whatever he wanted, and that was so good about him. It's magnificent. Yeah. Yeah. Drake, you've talked to him on the phone. You want to work with him? He's on your list of collaborations. Yeah. Do you have beats ready right now? If Drake was like, come, come to Canada and play me something. Are you sitting on beats that are ready for his ears? No, not yet, not yet. <laughs> no, because uh, I know Drake's a busy man, <laughs> <laughs> and I think he he wants to create right on the spot. Got it. So, but uh, if he calls me today, I'll come to Toronto. I'll be on my way. So. But would you miss your show at Hawkesson to be with him? <laughs> uh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> Can't no. do that. No, I think I, th- I think for me the fans are always the most important, and I I, I try to never cancel a show or miss a show so I I, th- I don't think I ever missed a show except wow. one time I, I run with my head against the screen right before I went on oh. Oh. Yeah, that, that's why I had to go to the hospital but <laughs> <laughs> that's the only time I missed the show hey how'd you discover Martin Garrix well the Garrix I discover, discovered because um, I heard a track of him he was already producing tracks and I heard a track on uh, online because you know I'm always looking for stuff and I heard this track, I was like, this sounds different. And then I, I approached him like, hey, uh, can I release this track on my label? And then that's how we became friends. And then we started sending stuff back and forth. And Dude, I'm telling you, that's what makes you so cool, is your genuine love and appreciation for not just music, but the artists that create it. And really, your radio show has given oxygen to the careers of so many. Do you feel like that's your duty as somebody who has achieved such incredible things? And really has shaped not just one genre but multiple genres of music. Yeah, I mean, I I love that. Like people ask ask me like, what are you the most proud of in your career? And I think that that's it. That, that I I brought a lot of people, new people to the scene, discovered a lot of artists, and support them, and be more, more like a mentor to them. And and Martin Garrix is one of the persons I'm the most proud of because when he was eight years old, he saw me uh, playing on TV, <laughs> and he, and he told his mom like, this is what I want to be. I, I want to be that guy. And then, you know. 14 years later he is that guy yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible cool, yeah. it, it couldn't have happened to a nicer 
more humble and really more talented human being than him. He yeah. is just... Yeah, he's incredible and he's so nice and uh, yeah, he's, he's the perfect example how a DJ should be in every way. So, it's so much better than the beef thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah <right>? seriously. <laughs> do you ever go to the club when you're not working? Yeah. You do? Yeah. You I, still enjoy it? I still enjoy it because, you know, you, you I always learn something. You know, you, yeah. you discover a new track or, mm -hmm. or a vibe and uh, yeah, I, I, I just love to go out. And so... Still, yeah. Wow. Besides the fact that I play three, four nights a week, I still, yeah. you know. You go. Yeah. By the way, uh, you, you know, remixes are obviously your thing. You're happy a remix with Ed Sheeran is awesome. All of me get, gets you a Grammy. Yeah. When somebody wants you to remix their song, what are you listening for and how do you know it's right for you? Yeah, I, I just feel it. I, I hear it right away. I feel like when I, when I hear a song like, oh, I can add something here. I, I can change this. I can make it more dance floor friendly so yeah i really look at that like so and um uh, yeah I, I i barely ask for a remix like they always come to me for a remix like even ed sheeran <laughs> it was pre a pretty big honor that he asked me for to, to remix his track and uh the only one i d did myself uh, approach was john legend with all of me you were just inspired from hearing it yeah i heard the, i heard the track and i was like yeah, yeah. For for fun, we just put a beat underneath, and it sounded right away a lot more energy. I was like, oh, and then yeah, it gets you a Grammy, but it also got me a Grammy. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. but, it, but it breathes a whole new life into that record. It yeah. makes it pop friendly. Yeah, yeah. It was it was totally a second life in the record, and it blew up everywhere. One moment from your career so far that you know you'll never forget. Well, that one for sure. Right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, that, it's incredible because I, was, I, would, I would release it as a free download on my birthday, just for fun. And then John, and John uh, called my management and was like, no, we need to do it as an official remix. And then to win a Grammy after that for that one is just incredible. It's quite a birthday present to yourself. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about performing at the Olympics? Because that, in that moment back then, you you really define the fact that music is without borders, and music really can bring anybody and everybody together, no matter what. Yeah. But it didn't happen until you appeared. Yeah, that was, that playing the Olympics was was amazing. I mean, it was a, a, a surreal experience, especially if it was in 2004. So, so long ago. Yeah, dance music was not even close to what it is nowadays. You know, yeah. to play at, at such a great uh, event. You know. I don't know how many billion people are watching. Man, what would so, dance music be without you? <laughs> Do you ever think about that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The world will never know. The, well, no, maybe not. Yeah. Jackie Chan is a single. Wait, I have one question great... real quick. Do you, ever, do you look at price tags when you go shopping? Uh, no. <laughs> you don't? You just kind of, I'll take it. How often do you yeah. look at your bank account? Every day. Does it, <laughs> how do you feel? I feel great. When the Forbes list comes out and you and Calvin Harris are always one and two, do you yeah. guys ever talk about that? Uh, no, not really. But but you know, I I never really have to think about money. So I, I mean, that's lucky for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I I grew up very poor, so I know the value of money very well. Mm -hmm. So but um, but when I DJ, I just think about the music. I never think, oh, tonight I make so much money. And <laughs> it, it never comes to my mind. It's, it's just an amazing feeling that you can always buy basically whatever you want and go for a nice restaurant and have nice dinners with a good <laughs> glass of wine. And Sounds nice. That's that's you know that's that's also happiness. But money doesn't bring you uh, happiness, but it brings you uh, a lot of easy comfort, I guess. Mm -hmm. you know? What motivates you then? What motivates me is is just the people and and the music, like like. Yeah, when you're in front of a hundred thousand people at the uh, Electric Daisy Carnival or in, in Miami at Ultra, you know that's a very unique experience. And I think I'm I'm addicted to be on stage and to, to play music for people because it's such a great feeling. It's the best feeling in the world. Do you have a hope for the future of dance music? Yeah, I mean it, it, it's never going to go away. You know, people were back in the '90s already saying like, "Oh, this is going to be gone in two years," and, yeah. and it, it keeps evolving. It, ju it just it's it's uh, it's a bit like the stock market. You know, it goes <laughs> up and down. <laughs> so, so sometimes dance music is more popular and then less popular, and then it reinvents itself and then it comes back. And then it's in in Ibiza, for example, now it's everything is deep house. Got it. Like everywhere they play is super tech and deep house music. Do you next trend for music? You said longer songs maybe coming back. Yeah, I think I think everything is gonna come back. You know, uh, even trance is coming back. It's, it's, Getting bigger again. Got to so. get back into it. Will you? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why do you you just turn your back to it, and when you leave it, you leave it? Yeah, no, not just that, but I think, like I said before, I, I have done everything I wanted in the trance world. Okay. So why would I go back and 
I know people w- would love me to come back. I see that all the time on, on my socials and stuff. I mean, but I think the people like the new Tiesto a lot too. So, And I like the new Tiesto more than going back in time and yeah. try to recreate something that was amazing then. So mm-hmm. let's keep the magic how it was there and yeah. and I keep the magic here, what, what, what I feel now. And last question, do you feel and know in your heart that you're gonna be making music forever or do you see a time where you're gonna end? I don't see a time yet where <laughs> I'm gonna end. Like, I, I mean, I just still really love it. So I, I think as soon as I lose the passion for it, then it's time to do something else. But there's so much stuff you can do. I mean, I'm probably not gonna play 150 gigs a year anymore in the future, yeah. but who knows, you know, uh, Mick Jagger is still on tour. Right. With the Rolling Stones. It's like 75, how old is he? Yeah, so maybe yeah. I'll, I'll become that kind of DJ. I'm yeah. like 75 years in old. The club, <laughs> yeah. Still going. <laughs> going strong, you know. We'll be 75 there with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. But you know what? You've paved the way and given opportunity to so many incredible musicians that will carry your legacy. And it's really, you've done an amazing thing for music. and. Yeah, cool. thank you. Very cool to talk to you and uh, understand yeah. you and your process. And it means a lot that you took the time. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, <laughs> nice to talk to you guys. Tiesto, everybody. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Chuck and Cheryl. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you did, please subscribe and also check out our podcast. There's a link in the description. And also comment and like and do things. Other interviews are on the screen somewhere. So click them. Thanks for watching. <laughs>